Hello there, Jeff Snow from First Baptist Church in Port Hope. Here, well, if you're a visual person, here you go, very high tech. That's who I am. And uh, last week we did our message from the church sanctuary and we put the sound through the sound system and it sounded better. Um, but we got a couple of bats flying around the sanctuary today and even though I'm wearing a hat to keep them out of my hair, I thought I'd move back to my office just for today and hopefully the sound is good enough that you'll be able to follow what we're going to talk about today. Because I want to tell you a story. Um, I was reading a book today that brought to mind one of my favorite Jesus stories in the New Testament. So I thought I wanted to share it with you. This occurred, if you want to look it up afterwards, it's found in John chapter 8. And um, it was at a time when the Pharisees were beginning to find Jesus to be a problem. And um, primarily they were upset at the fact that they considered to hit him to be blasphemous, that he was calling himself the Messiah. Now, if it was just some crazy dude out in the desert that nobody was paying attention to and ignoring, probably the Pharisees and the, the rulers of the religious law probably would not have even bothered with him. But the fact was that Jesus was gaining a following. People were discovering that no one taught like him, and the miracles he performed were things that nobody else was able to do. And the Pharisees, to give them the benefit of the doubt, they didn't want people to be deceived. They also didn't want to lose their following. They didn't want to um, have people start following Jesus instead of them. So we start off the story seeing Jesus teaching publicly in the temple, and he, and he acknowledged to the crowd listening to him that some people, some of the leaders, are wanting to kill him. And the people started talking amongst themselves, and, and they heard Jesus, and they realized who he was, and, and um, that this was, he said he was the Messiah, and, and yet the religious leaders were doing nothing to, to tease him or to stop him from saying that. So, so the people started to go, hmm, have the religious leaders started to come around? Are they believing that Jesus was the Messiah too? A little later on in his teaching, he said very specifically that he had come from God. And that, of course, got the Pharisees totally um, just angry at him because he, this was utter blasphemy. And they tried to seize him and arrest him right there. And all the scripture says was that they couldn't. It doesn't say why. It doesn't say what happened. It just said they couldn't because it wasn't Jesus' time. Jesus was ultimately in control of everything. God was in control of what was going on. And it wasn't Jesus' time to be arrested. Um, so many believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And they pointed to the miracles that he did uh, as proof. And the Pharisees heard what was going on, that, that Jesus was gaining more and more of a following. So this time they decided to send their guards, the temple guards, to go, go and arrest him. Go and arrest Jesus and, and bring him back. So the Pharisees waited. And sometime later, the guards came back by themselves, empty-handed. And... The Pharisees and the religious leaders were saying, so we sent you to go get Jesus. Where's Jesus? And all we could say was, no one spoke like this man. He's unique. This he was amazing. And the Pharisees, I can imagine just rolling their eyes going, oh, man, has he got you too? Did, did, did you fall for that as well? Did he deceive you as well? The Pharisees thought they were on pretty solid ground in saying that Jesus wasn't the Messiah because Jesus was a Galilean, came from Galilee, and the scriptures clearly said that the Messiah was going to be from Bethlehem. And of course, if they had decided to do a little research, they would have found out that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But they didn't bother to really try and find out. And sometimes that's what happens with people. They find out a bit about Jesus, and decide based on that that he's just not for them. But they don't really take the time to really find out the truth about Jesus. 
to how he wants to connect to their lives. So the Pharisees decided, well, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. The guards failed. We couldn't arrest them, so we got to come up with a plan C. And so they figured they would do something to get the people to turn against them. And they would do that by tricking Jesus with a dilemma that was so tricky that no matter what he did, no matter how he responded, he would be seen as being wrong in the people's eyes. So they hatched up this plan. And so we see maybe the next day or a few days later, Jesus was again teaching the temple courts and all these people were surrounding him and listening to him and all of a sudden, this commotion takes place at the back of the crowd, and the crowd starts to part. And a bunch of Pharisees come through, dragging this woman who's trying to cover herself up with sheets or something. And they're dragging her to Jesus, and they make her stand in front of Jesus, and she's there trying to cover herself up with these sheets. And they say to Jesus, we've caught this woman in the act of adultery. Moses said in the law that we should stone her. What do you say? Pharisees figured this was a pretty safe case. Um, this was a woman. Notice they didn't bring the man. It takes two to do adultery. They brought the woman. And in those days, in that society, women were basically treated like property. Their testimony was not valid in court. Um, they had no say in anything. And so bringing the woman before Jesus, um, in their eyes, was a safer move because she couldn't argue about it. And adultery was pretty black and white when it comes to the, the Jewish religion. There was no question as to what the proper judgment should be. And, and they say that the scripture says that they caught her in the act, which always leads me to wonder, was it a setup? How do you catch someone in the act? So this woman was brought before Jesus and humiliated and made to stand before him. And they reminded Jesus and they reminded everyone who was listening, because the point of this, that the law said that such a woman should be stoned to death. And basically they turned to Jesus and said, what say you? What do you say? Because if Jesus went against the law and said, no, no, don't stone her, then he would have broken a religious law and they might have, they would have caused to arrest him and, and caused to make a case before the people that all that Jesus wanted to do was destroy the law and destroy the Jewish religion. And if he said, yeah, you're right, go ahead and stone her, he, he would be going against everything that he had been teaching about grace and mercy and the coming kingdom of God. And the people would have had second thoughts and they would have said, well, you, you say one thing and you do another and they would have turned on him. And so the Pharisees thought, well, we've got this full foolproof case against Jesus. But Jesus didn't answer right away. He stopped and thought about it. And it's often the wisest thing not to answer right away. It's a good idea not to press send too quickly. And so we are told in the story that Jesus bent down and he wrote on the ground with his finger. Was he doodling? Was he trying to buy time to figure out what to do in this very tricky dilemma? And the Pharisees were growing impatient. They're saying, Jesus, we asked you a question. Get up off the ground. Stop playing around in the dirt. What do you what should we do? What do you say that we should do? And they the Pharisees were starting to think, hey, we've got him this time. We've got him this time. Um, then Jesus stood up and he looked at everyone, looked at the Pharisees, and he gave his answer. And he said, Let any one of you who is without sin cast the first stone at her. Then he bent over and went back to writing on the ground. 
The Bible doesn't specify or say what he was writing, but I've heard it suggested that he may have been writing words like liar, cheat, lustful, thief, or even adulterer. And that as the Pharisees read each one, God pricked their conscience. And they began to realize that Jesus' statement was correct. But they could not cast a stone at her because they were just as guilty of sins before God. The Bible does say that one by one, they just dropped their stones and walked away. The oldest first, and then to the youngest. I, I often think it's either because maybe the oldest were wiser and they knew what Jesus said was right and they realized it quicker, or maybe the oldest had, had lived longer, you know, and, and just maybe had committed more sins and they were able to relate and connect with what Jesus was writing on the ground sooner. And after they had all gone away, Jesus, who was, was still kind of ignoring them all and doodling on the ground, um, stood up. And the woman was still standing there, knowing who this Jesus was and still shivering in fear. And Jesus looks at her and, she, and he asks, where are they? Where are the people who are condemning you? Are they here? Who's condemning you? And she said, no one. And he said, neither do I condemn you. He demonstrated the grace and the mercy of God. And the, the funny thing is, out of everyone in that crowd, the people listening, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, Jesus, out of everyone in that crowd, he alone could have actually cast the stone by the standard that he had set. But he was without sin. He could have thrown the first stone. But he didn't. And then he said something really significant, which I think is one of the most powerful statements in the New Testament. And he says to the woman, go now and leave your life of sin. King James Version says, go and sin no more. Notice he didn't stop at go now. No one's, I don't condemn you, go. And if he had just said that, the woman kind of would have gone, oh, phew, off the hook. Well, where, where's the guy? Back, back to what I was doing before. I mean, Jesus said, he doesn't condemn me. Sometimes when we read things of the scripture, we kind of stop halfway through things and we don't get the whole picture. Jesus wasn't providing you know, just total absolution in the absence of any kind of repentance. He said, go and sin no more. Go and leave your life of sin. Jesus condemns sin, but he takes that condemnation on himself. He knew at this time that he would be taking the condemnation for sin upon himself on the cross. And so in his grace and in his mercy, he did not condemn the woman. And he gave her forgiveness. And he gave her a second chance. He says, you're forgiven. Now go and live a life that avoids the things that would cause you to have to be forgiven again in the future. I can just imagine the woman's response. Initially, probably shocked. She probably stood there and went, uh, does this mean I can go? And, just, and then I can picture her gathering all her sheets around herself and, and walking away, kind of looking back at Jesus, almost not believing what had just happened. And increasingly amazed, increasingly grateful at the second chance that she had been given. I think she took Jesus' words to heart and she didn't go back to where she was before. She built on this second chance, I would believe, to create a new life for herself. 
Like the Pharisees brought this woman before Jesus. We are all, whether we want to believe it or not, we're all brought before Jesus with our sin. It could be by our conscience that is picking at us, letting us know that what we're doing is not what we were created to do, that it, it is something that is missing the mark of what God has for our lives, that, that we're doing things that hurt ourselves, hurt other people, or hurt God. Sometimes we're bought, we're bought before Jesus with our sin by the accusation of others. And sometimes that's not a good thing. And sometimes it, it pricks our conscience, knowing that we've done something wrong. And sometimes it's just the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the first thought when that happens is to get out, get out of there, you know, to run away. I don't want to face this. But we can't run from God, whether it's in this life for the life to come. We always need to stand before him. And if we did run from God, well, we'd be missing out on some really neat words that he wants to say to us. We come before Jesus and he has every right to condemn us. But his desire is to forgive us. And so we want to receive the forgiveness that he offers. And then don't be like, oh, phew, Bob's that boy. Okay, go back to what I was doing before. No, the challenge is to go and turn away from sin. To leave behind the sinful habits, leave behind the sinful practices, to begin to allow God to transform us into the image of Christ, to work his holiness in us so that we can go and live the life that God created us to live. We all stand accused, every one of us, with no real good argument in our defense. And the one who could condemn you has decided that he'd rather forgive you. So the challenge is to accept that forgiveness and then go and with his help and guidance begin to head in the opposite direction of where you've been taking your life. The challenge is to go and leave sinful ways behind. And to go and live the life that Jesus wants you to live. That Jesus created you to live. Father, I thank you for your interaction with people. Thank you for Jesus interacting with people in the New Testament and that we have records of it. We thank you, Lord, for the grace and the mercy that he's shown, that he also shows to us. And we thank you for the challenge that he presented to that woman, which is the same challenge he presents to us. Thank you for your forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to accept that forgiveness, not to live lives in, in the enemy's condemnation or the condemnation of others. Help us, Lord, to see sin the way you do, so that we would respond to our consciences and come before you to receive your forgiveness. And then help us, Lord, to change direction and to go and live life differently. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness, for your grace, and for your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope you have a good June. Tomorrow is June if you're watching this on the day when it gets posted. Um, but if you're watching this in 2022, well, have a great week. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. God bless. Oh, if you, if you are watching this live and we can be of any help to you at all at First Baptist Church in Port Hope, give us a call. Call the office 905-885-6021. Across the bottom of the screen here. Oh, it's not there. Okay. Listen carefully. 905-885-6021. And if we could be of any help to you at all, um, give us a call. We'd be glad to do what we can. God bless.